Hi everyone, I'm Helena B. Scott. Those of you who follow my Facebook page will know who I am, but for newcomers, I'd like to share that I'm a writer, researcher, and historian specializing in secret history, the paranormal, and the occult, but also the gothic. I'm also a sensitive or mental and light trans medium. I am a creative soul that likes to uncover mysteries and wrongdoings, buried by the veil of history and time, giving a voice to the voiceless, those who are no longer living, but nevertheless have a story to tell. I strive to make things right, to bring justice, often rewriting history, correcting or adding what was purposely omitted. My journey has taken me across countries and continents to abandoned stately homes like Ireland's most haunted house, Loftus Hall in County Wexford, medieval castles, historic transatlantic ocean liners like the Queen Mary, and archaeological sites, and even to assisting in finding missing children or helping loved ones left behind by the departed. Hi everyone and welcome back. In this week's podcast on aura and chakra balancing, I'll be picking up from where I left off talking about energy. A few weeks ago, we covered how everything is made up of fragments of energy and how within our bodies, we have our own unique energy system made up of seven main chakras, which allow the flow of energy through our bodies. Knowledge of the chakras is necessary not just for overall well-being, but also for rebalancing them, and more importantly, grounding. This is key when interacting with spirits and visiting haunted locations to protect ourselves from attachments and dark entities, but also to interact safely with any human spirits. If we take a look at the diagram I've made with uh, the chakras, you can see the location of our seven main chakras and the colors, with the root chakra, red, the first chakra, being slightly outside our body in symmetry with the last chakra, the seventh chakra or the crown chakra, both being in our auric body or physical body within the aura layers, which I'll explain what that is in a moment. The colors, location, and order are all important, and we need to visualize them and know them for proper grounding. It is also important to follow a set procedure, which I will explain again in a moment. So now that we know, looking at this diagram and remembering what we covered last week, what our chakras look like, their order, and where they are, grounding is the very first step. This is our connection with Mother Earth, which is why it's also called earthing, and it's about being fully present in the now, while remaining anchored to our physical world. If we don't ground ourselves, we can feel a little dizzy, off balance, and it can be dangerous for us. Usually grounding involves a brief visualization meditation, where we close our eyes for a moment. Although most people will visualize themselves as grounded through their feet, with roots going deep into the earth, I advise to ground in three points, with the spine too, and alternatively drop heavy anchors into the earth. I like anchors because I used to sail, and I always used to drop the anchor when I was sailing, so for me, for me, this is very easy to um, visualize. And once those anchors are dropped, they are heavy and normally the boat stays put, so you will stay put. Connect with the earth and feel its energy coming up through your roots or anchors as you prefer. Make sure that wherever you have your roots or anchors, they are firmly rooted and secure. Next, we will have to set up our protection to protect our auric shield and energy. I'll provide full grounding and protection meditations in my workshops, but for now, an easy way to protect yourself is to imagine a bubble of light surrounding you, preferably a darker light, blue or violet, when working in haunted locations and not white. 
White light is used for cleansing and energizing and clearing space. But if you cloak yourself in white light, it will draw all sorts of spirits to you like a moth to a flame. So it's best to use dark blue, indigo blue or violet light to cloak your energy from dark entities, which you really don't really want to interact with. Next, we will set an intention, for example, by asking the spirit world through our gatekeeper to only allow connection with human spirits or beings of the light, the purpose being for the highest good. Then we'll follow this up by opening up and expanding our aura and then chakras one by one. And again, this is for a more advanced workshop. I will explain that there. Next, we will invite spirits to make their presence known and to reach out to us, to come close to us, to let us know that they're there. At the end of the session, we will need to close down our energy, give thanks to any spirits that reached out to us, and again, ground and protect ourselves. This is very important as we do not wish to stay open and allow anything to attach to us, which can also happen when we're under the influence of drugs or alcohol or in certain emotional states. This is why it's never advisable to interact with the spirit world under these circumstances. Also, the way we close down our energy, grounding and protecting our aura and chakras at the end is crucial, not just when visiting haunted locations, but Anytime we read or learn anything about the spirit world, even now when you're listening to this podcast, we tend to open up again. This is something that I actually never realized and wondered why at certain times I had so much paranormal activity around me, especially when doing research and or training, studying, until one of my mentors mentioned a few years ago that every time I did anything even reading connected to the other world, I was opening myself up to being reached by spirits. So, so no grounding before protecting and or closing down my energy plus clearing the space meant that I was reachable 24-7. It's like I had a light saying, hey, I'm here, come and get me, you know, or come and reach out. And sometimes it was even impossible to get any sleep. So, I generally recommend that you actually do this daily um, when going to bed and when leaving the house as well, not just to protect your energy from spirits and entities which are everywhere, not just in haunted locations or locations known as haunted, but also from psychic attacks by other humans, whether intentional or, or not. This, again, is something that I will discuss in future workshops. Our aura. What is it? Some yoga traditions actually consider the aura to be the eighth chakra, which in a way makes sense as the aura is influenced and connected to the chakras. We can define the aura as the body's electromagnetic field, the subtle field of energy that surrounds and protects the body. It can extend up to nine feet around us or shrink down to three feet when we're not feeling our best. The aura helps to sense the world around us, increasing our awareness also when it comes to our interaction with the spirit world. It helps to impress our energy, thoughts and feelings. Some people can actually see the aura. It is usually protected by an invisible shield, but sometimes negative energies that we encounter can pierce this layer and filter through contaminating the aura and in turn affecting our chakras, which can make us unwell or result in attachments. These negative energies can include electromagnetic fields, low-level radiation and natural negative energies of places like those found in ley lines, which are associated with hauntings and dark force entities or demonic entities. I actually have a telltale sign for these dark negative energies and ley lines and it's it feels really strange but whenever I hear, feel or come across um, a negative dark entity 
or ley line. It feels as if I'm being pulled by an invisible rope from my stomach and I can get a slight passing headache or migraine as well. In fact, many people say that they feel that they have migraines or headaches or they feel sick um, whenever they are on a ley line. So bear that in mind. It can affect your, your general well-being. Going back to the aura, as I mentioned before, the aura is connected to the chakras and therefore there are seven layers in the aura to match the seven main chakras. And they connect the chakras as based on the diagram, the second diagram that I've created for you guys. The aura is important in terms of energy as it can develop holes through which attachments can occur. And we'll talk about cords later as well with chakras. But knowing how it works is also crucial for safe spirit communication and mediumship. Channeling and trance mediumship, which I've experienced, involves spirits sitting in some of your auric fields, affecting some of our chakras or all, respectively, as in trance mediumship. A note here, when it comes to attachments and possession, attachments will affect only our aura and are much easier to eliminate. Having said this, some will prove quite obstinate, but possession happens at a physical level, which is why it can be much harder to detect or eliminate. Interacting with the spirit world has its risks, which is why it must be done ethically and safely. Dark entities are real, and they can masquerade as beings of the light quite easily through Ouija boards or seance sessions, which is why most mediums avoid these, as not even the most experienced medium can ever guarantee what is going to come through. And once you summon a presence, you may be dealing with more than you can handle. This is a risk, and most people will not know how to handle whatever comes through. This is why I don't engage in any of this, and mostly interact with spirits when they reach out to me, avoiding provoking them or seeking them. Also, some human spirits can be quite nasty, angry, and violent due to their personality being amplified in the spirit world but also due to being confused, having unfinished business, or simply not wanting to let go of life, wanting to still hold on. Bear in mind that like can attract or does attract like, and that not just dark force entities pose a threat. Also, when we visit a haunted location, we need to behave ethically and with respect, as we are the intruders. Never forget this, as this may be the cause of their anger and can create many issues, especially with large numbers of people suddenly invading what was once their home. How would you feel if that happened? You would probably feel angry, especially if you didn't know that you were dead and suddenly all these people came barging through your door. Remember why it is that you're doing this, interacting with the spirit world. Why you want to learn about the spirit world and spirit communication. What are you prepared to do for them? And how can you give back? Because you must. You really must give back. Always do it for the right reason. Never for entertainment or just for the thrill. As humans that were once alive, spirits deserve your compassion, respect and also help. This is why I tend to be against public investigations and haunted events with the general public, which I feel are mostly exploitative in theatre, disrespectful, and actually quite dangerous while doing nothing for spirits in such locations. Checking our aura and chakras. Regardless of our lifestyle and whether or not we purposely interact with the spirit world, we should check our aura and chakras to heal and rebalance them often. We can do this ourselves many ways, as I'll explain in future workshops, or we can have a professional do this, which is advisable when working extensively with the paranormal as I do. I usually do my own spiritual hygiene, as I call it, but every three or four months, I will have a consultation with a healing psychic at the London College of Psychic Studies, where I'm a member, to check me out, cleanse, rebalance, and see 
if there's anything up because I'm exposed to more frequent contact with the spirit world than most people. A note when checking, start with your aura first before checking the chakras for any imbalance or checking or when checking for attachments. If we're sensitive to energy, simply using our hands along our aura may sense a hole in our aura or an imbalance. We can also use a pendulum as well. Things that help to heal the aura are developing a steady spiritual practice as well as learning all you can about grounding and protection. I will be offering specific workshops on this very soon, so please stay tuned. Staying grounded by meditating in nature, spending time outdoors, or if you can, walking barefoot on the earth or even at the beach really helps with the aura. Water, which I love, and being in water is especially helpful as it is a powerful cleanser and resets our electromagnetic field, especially when in nature, so lakes, rivers, the sea, even rainwater. Wearing white also helps to project the aura, and certain crystals like selenite or amethyst help repair and protect the aura, as well as herbs, white sage, and oils. In addition, we can call on the help of archangels such as Michael and the Ascended Masters. Having said this, once the aura is cleansed or repaired, it needs to be fortified and protected. The same goes for the chakras, the meridians, and the energy cocoon, if we really want to be thorough and are exposed to the paranormal frequently. This is highly complex and best done by invoking help from the Archangels, Ascended Masters, and by a professional, unless we take the time to seriously study it. It is, however, quite fascinating. Colors, food, crystals, oils, herbs, and numbers are all associated with the chakras, and in turn, the aura. In fact, in mediumship, we often speak about seeing in colors when it comes to the aura and spirit communication, too. As this is an introductory podcast, I'm going to leave it here, but I'm going to share all the diagrams I mentioned and a table I've created for you all. I'll soon be sharing a grounding and protection meditation. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for my upcoming podcast in the next few weeks. Have a great Sunday night, everyone.